Yeah, hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to one of the most important videos I have ever made. I am self and we are talking about the Paragon's future, its future development. And you know what? It is our job, like I said, in my call to the community, my call to action for the community. We simply need to be supportive, show our dedication, show our appreciation, show our love for this game and give our honest feedback and just our ideas and how it can be made better. So here it is, ladies and gentlemen, some ideas for Paragon's future. All of these ideas are not mine and come from the community as a whole. I want to stress that so much. None of these are mine. None of these are novel. I don't claim any of these ideas whatsoever. I've taken them from the Monolith Magazine, Sneaky Paragon, did that Sneaky Industries. Um, so many people I've literally just kind of copy pasted. Some of these are maybe the ones I thought of, but they're no way novel. I want to stress that. These are from you guys. You guys helped me help, help, help me help me make this. And I just wanted to provide a document. There's lots of them out there, um, you know, for, for Epic to chew on. So thank you guys. This is a community effort. A hundred thousand percent. Many, many people have given their thoughts and ideas towards helping keep Paragon alive. And these are many of those ideas, at least from my circle of influence that I have, you know, that I have g gotten from. While we all might have different visions for exactly what Paragon is or should be, we can all share the same vision in having Paragon becoming successful. This is important to remember as sometimes our ideas or visions cloud the path towards success. It is up to us to remember to stay open and willing to change in pursuit of that success. I have broken down the ideas into two general categories, things that I personally think must happen and things that honestly still should happen, but realistically and honestly, there isn't much difference between the two categories. I just had to see, I just had to separate them to suit reality. So must happen ideas and especially the first three, four, five, honestly, in my opinion, these have to, these have to happen. Implement monolithic matchmaking and ranked modes. This is going to contain two leagues, ranked and unranked. In a perfect world, ranked queues are going to involve your solo queue, twos and threes, battle other twos and threes, and fives queue. The unranked leagues will have solo queue with an option to be put with twos, threes, and fours. Twos plus threes and fours queue, meaning twos and threes can battle a four and a one, a four and a one can battle another four and a one, etc., etc., and a fives queue. This is in a perfect world with enough concurrent players playing. If not enough players, though, whole queues can simply be not eliminated, but just um, not enabled to fill other leagues and other queues. And it really is that simple. And that's a simple fix. Voice chat would add a key tool to increase the competitive nature of matches. Obviously, you can, it can be muted and enabled, disabled, etc. Implementing ranked and mat monolithic matchmaking is so important in order to give people the environment that they want to play Paragon in. Not only is ranked the stepping stone for competitive play, which this would further facilitate, but it also allows people to play with players of similar mindsets and expectations. This provides a challenge and a goal for players to work towards. That is such a huge point. This further increases player retention and player investment, which is currently the biggest issue. It would go so far, and I this is absolutely huge. This point has to happen. Second point is execute on simply finishing marketing and releasing Paragon. Hashtag bake the cake, finish baking the cake and let people eat it. Don't take it out of the oven before it's done. Execute on the vision. Paragon can be a flagship title, truly. It can be a showcase of the Unreal Engine. It can be a showcase of a raw, ultra high vi visual fidelity title with fantastic gameplay. It can be a showcase of thriving cross-platform three and play and i honestly believe that showcase of a cross genre title as a third person moba shooter and moba paragon has potential and deserves it so simply execute and put it on the market in my opinion of course this is in my opinion and a lot of others 
of course. The third issue that needs to be solved is core gameplay issues need to be solved, such as balancing Fangtooth and reducing the snowball effect. One part one of this is reduce power gain to two power and then four power after after four kills. But I would almost suggest maybe even reworking the buffs entirely to essentially not provide power, especially with some changes I, I propose later on. The first kill would maybe grant health regen and gold to more facilitate the early game. The second kill grants mana regen and gold, maybe facilitates more ability usage. The third kill grants that movement speed as more towers and inhibitors are down to facilitate that. Fourth kill grants that non-hero damage boost to really solidify key objectives, finish out the game. And then subsequent kills now finally grant this power, but will be reworked into something else later on with an idea, and gold. The power at the fifth kill and gold along the way should provide a su sufficient advantage for one team to close out a match. I mean, having five fang, fang tooth, uh, you know, is is a pretty big achievement. So that I think that is fair. With no power until the fifth kill, and with reducing the damage tanks and vitality based builds will do, which we'll get to in a mi minute. The advantage should be more effective, more sh should be more effective for promoting each hero to fulfill a certain role. The key issue is that currently. Power from Fangtooth enables non-damage dealers to perform outside of their role. And it really is quite, it's quite, quite obvious and striking to me. B, what has to happen in, in, in the core gameplay department is reducing tank slash vitality build damage and also from cards that 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 have uh, vitality that actually isn't in here even though the focus is currently on hero to hero combat in paragon that doesn't mean everyone needs to deal the damage numbers supports and tanks need to facilitate the combat and help it in being prominent they do this through healing, slows, stuns, silences, roots, shields, buffs, debuffs, etc. Just simply not damage. Remove power from the tier 7 vitality slot, replace it with health, health and regen. Could be a small amount of basic damage, doesn't feed into abilities, to help brawlers and bruisers. Next, severely reduce or remove power from vitality cost cards. If a certain level of damage is simply needed for a tank or a tanky fighter in order to in order to 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 match some sort of you know idea or vision or concept for a hero, it should instead come from a base kit. The, the see the this the last core gameplay issue here is reducing hard crowd control damage slash durations and increasing crowd control mitigation options hard cc durations seem a bit high for paragon's game speed the numbers look fine on paper even when comparing to other mobas but monolith's games but with monolith's game speed they're simply too long hard hard crowd controls damage itself plus the current overt damage from tanks and brawlers seems to kill people too quickly and not provide competitive counterplay or simply healthy engagement dynamics focusing abilities that have hard cc around the fact that they have hard cc and not damage would make them more purposeful and relevant three increase the amount of purify slash cc mitigation cards and gems this would provide more engaging gameplay and counterplay options that would also be more competitive four add hard cc diminishing returns this makes crowd control much more skillful and reduces bad gameplay being stun locked to death needs to be a costly and a limited occurrence just like getting one shot from stealth it forces a team to spread hard cc out to get more value from it requiring additional targeting and tactical execution or pay for a completely stun locked hero with many and subsequently less valuable cc abilities so this is how it works and stick with me here while stunned or rooted while you are stun locked getting layered with stuns subsequent hard cc would be reduced in duration by 33 percent adding multiplicatively the first stun while stun locked is 100 percent value then 66 percent value then 44 percent value then 30 then 30 percent value etc 
etc. So the first stun, all of these stuns are two seconds, just to keep it simple. We're talking about four two-second stuns being layered on top of each other. The first one gets full value for two seconds. The second two-second stun is now only is now only a 1.33 second stun for a total of 3.33 seconds instead of four. The third two-second stun is now only a 0 0.89 second stun for a total of 4.2. The fourth is now four is only 0.9 seconds stun for a total of 4.79 seconds instead of eight seconds of stun lock. Now that is significant. Eight seconds of stun lock is simply for the number of reasons we, we've stated, but that is what that would look like while being stun locked. The diminishing returns would reset when out of combat or after six to eight seconds. I am not a MOBA expert. I'm not a, you know, MOBA designer. So that simply seems reasonable to me. While in the same combat instance, however, this is another mechanic, so when you are not stun locked, but in the same in combat instance, subsequent hard ZC would be reduced in duration by 20% instead of 33%, adding multiplicatively, meaning the first stun gets 100% value, the second stun in the same in combat instance, but not stun locked, is 80% value, 64%, 51% value, etc. So in the same scenario with four two second stuns being applied to you, but not stun locked. The first st two second stun is, a two, is gets two seconds of value. The second two second stun is 1.6 seconds, 1.28, 1.02, meaning that in this scenario, you are stunned for 5.9 seconds total instead of 4.79. So you get a full 1.2 seconds more value out of your heart CC by spreading it out. Remember, this is, this is because this makes it more skillful and reduces bad gameplay. The diminishing returns of this mechanic would again re reset when out of combat or after six to 10 seconds. The fourth core issue, uh, or the, four, the, the, four, the fourth thing that needs to happen here is onboarding. And this is tutorials and helping new players get just get into the game. I did have my tutorial script at the bottom of this document, which is linked in the video description. Please take my tutorial series and make it an in-game experience. I've linked it here. It's eight, it's, it's, I think it's, it, it's a good place to start. People need to be taught the intricacies of a complex genre like, like MOBAs in order to stick around. Overloading new players does not help with engagement or encourage player investment. See a step-by-step, -step, eight steps or more like mine. It has to be substantial, optional, multi-hour tutorial that builds on itself is absolutely needed. The fifth, the fifth big thing that needs to happen is patch the replay system to be in not such a compromised state. Keep it in at least, keep it in at least a non-buggy, stable, functional, but more importantly, watchable fashion. New competitive or, or viewer features and options can come later. This at least enables the competitive scene to have what they need in terms of casting, tournaments, replay analysis, etc. I think this is very, very important. Six, the sixth big, big thing that needs to happen, in my opinion, is balances to towers, inhibitors, and super minions and super minion waves. Towers, inhibitors, and the core need to deal additional or additive stacking damage with each shot. Tanks and brawlers still don't take enough damage from towers when diving. Tower diving is simply too prevalent and not punished enough, especially for how valuable picks are, which leads to objectives and the whole snowball effect. B. Towers, inhibitors, and the core projectiles need to track outside of tower radius. Each shot locks to its target, charges up, and the projectile homes onto the target regardless of their position when the shot is either discharged or when charging. This eliminates tower dancing. If a tower targets you, you are guaranteed to be hit once. There's nothing you can do about it. Again, eliminating tower dancing. Super minion waves health and the health aura it gives to nearby minions needs to be reduced and the aura eliminated. The wave is simply too punishing and waves are too hard to kill. Having an inhibitor down is too much of a death sentence and disadvantage. 
especially because a super minion wave is too punishing for how easy the inhibitors T2s and T1s can be taken down, especially from such a small advantage, like a single hero pick or a single out of position hero. A lot of this is just the snowball effect and how one thing leads to another with seemingly um, little reason or value. D, inhibitors and T2 towers need backdoor protection when minions aren't within radius. This is a bit buggy, I think, because I don't think inhibitors of armor when minions aren't within radius, or it is buggy, and as I recall certain times, inhibitors taking full damage with no minions inside, but also taking re reduced damage without. It, it may be buggy, but they absolutely need backdoor protection when minions aren't within radius. A hundred thousand percent seven the seventh thing that's very important is all accounts must have one copy of all cards and gems from the start everybody has gems but at least all accounts must have one copy of all cards and gems from the start and it this may be different from the pve aspect but at least in pvp this must happen rng account development based you know, based on uh, on cards and gems, simply is not engaging, nor significant. It really, is not a thing. This increases the baseline competitive nature of the game. This also creates an equal battlefield for all. I cannot undervalue the principle behind this fact. Creating an equal battlefield for all is a incredible value and and statement to have and is a principle that has to be upheld the eighth thing that 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 needs to happen is removal slash overhaul of the shadow buff this is uh this I, I directly did get from from sneaky the shadow buff solely controls the game at a competitive level if a team gets shadow buff without their opponents knowing one pick snowballs into one to two objectives even if both teams know about the shadow buff this basically means that one or even both teams essentially can't make a move out of safe areas or towers for 40 to 50 seconds. RNG of this extreme nature is simply not competitive. Two options, nerf the timer to 15-20 seconds or reduce the RNG of it of, of its spawning or remove it altogether. And I personally like the second option more. Some other essential ideas that are simply you know, I had to split up into two categories, but um, it, in all intents and purposes, this, they are just as meaningful as the previous. Remove deck making and introduce affinity shop. Geronimo Jack, Sneaky, uh, mainly where I got it from, but the monolith, monolithic uh, magazine had has it as well um, and the more i the more i think about it the more i like it for new players deck making is a hard mechanic to learn and becomes a major turnoff this makes new players unlikely to return and hurts player retention deck making is not overly competitive as one essentially has to guess in order to counter entire enemy builds when picking your deck at the start of a match that is huge and should not be underestimated. Gems are an easier fix, as you could choose which gem you want in-game when you reach that pip. Simply drop down menu or however it is, you pick the gem of your choice. This provides a way for you to counter-build at that time. Spending one to 4,000 gold to change your gems to counter-build slash change one's build on the fly might provide a competitive option. If you want to spend economy to change a key gem, that is a definitely a potential competitive option. So how would the affinity shop look? Simply you pick your hero in draft. Next, pick two affinities during the match at the item shop. Both affinities don't have to be selected immediately. This provides a competitive strategy in disabling enemies from seeing your second affinity and preventing them from counter building, but it also hurts you in not having access to those cards. So there is that competitive take, you know, give and take that is definitely a interesting option. Have a shop like menu to pick from all cards in those two affinities. This promotes the idea of cards. You have more to pick from and decks because you are choosing two affinities that creates your deck while introducing more options for counterplay. Each card would have a one to 200 gold equipped fee or just a 
or just a blanket equipped fee to to, to equip any card or disc or 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 discard a, a card in addition to their attribute points or gold cost. This would prevent people from switching cards constantly to counteract enemy builds as it would eventually put them behind in economy. The next idea is a bit of a consideration between how much time is left and how much resources the studio has as it is reduced space movement speed and increased map size. Increasing the map size sounds like an incredible undertaking that may or may not be possible right now. So reduce base movement speed is the option so far here. The time to travel from one side of the map to the other is, is simply too quick. There is little penalty for poor rotations or effective split pushing. B. Time to travel from lane to lane needs to be increased. This will punish players for bad rotations and commit teams to watch for split push mechanics. The MOBA skill ceiling and subsequent competitive nature of Paragon would increase in this way. The 11th thing that needs to happen is mat certain matchmaking ideas. One is prevent players with under 100 games that can that and and that can be tweaked from playing with players above 100 games unless a match cannot be found in a in in a terribly reasonable time one new players should simply not play with experienced players and this would help the new player experience and retention which is a core issue at at the moment this a, se a second option would be allow players to take their account as a smurf Smurf accounts will bypass the 100 game requirement, preventing them from playing with new players. It's not a perfect solution, but it is there. Somebody in chat had an interesting uh, suggestion of, uh, of, of tying your account with a cell phone number. So maybe some privacy uh, considerations in there, but that is that is something that most people only have one of, and is maybe a a interesting idea in this regard. The twelfth thing that 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 has to happen is increase objective significance. Increase the health of all siege objectives. Towers should be harder to kill, especially T twos and inhibitors. The snowball effect from getting siege objectives is too great from what little advantage one needs to take down such weak structures. B, remove the health regen from, from inhibitors so that they can be sieged over time instead of taken in one push. If they are subsequent enough, value needs to stick in terms of sieging down core structures, if they are substantial enough in the health department, that is. Fangtooth and Prime Guardian need health and in increases to make them a challenge to, to, to be taken and be more significant. Again, the snowball effect from taking these is simply too strong and too little of an advantage is needed in order to secure these buffs. The 13th thing that has to happen, more involvement with the competitive scene. Fund grassroots competitive leagues and tournaments with some monetary support. B. Have a competitive team slash league sort of asset Google folder doc that has logos, backgrounds, banners, clips, videos, etc., etc. Just assets available for these organizations to use. That will go a long, long way. 14. Establish a regular release schedule. Get on a schedule of a new card and a new gym every two to three weeks. Maybe every week is is a bit much. So that's why every two to three weeks, at least a new card and a new gym. B, get on a schedule of a new hero around six to eight weeks. New content keeps peoples around, increases player retention, which is a issue right now. The 15th thing is release and rework heroes to have more interesting and challenging kits mechanically and just by design. Having a challenge and a depth to a hero provides a goal for players to strive for. This encourages player investment, skill development, and player retention once again. 16. Balance heroes and mechanics, in-game mechanics, gameplay mechanics, top down. The highest potential of game mechanics, hero design, and optimization has to be based on the highest of skill 
potential. What, how are the pros playing and how are they utilizing what the game provides? This way, the full and intended complexity, depth, strategy, and tactical diversity in Paragon can thrive and be, and be actualized and realized and be available to, to, to people. Cre this creates a more engaging, dynamic, and skill-based competitive scene which will help that thrive. And this provides a skilled a skill ceiling that new players can strive for and be invested in achieving. Again, this will increase player retention and investment. 17, more jungle camps, new buffs, objectives, and more verticality. This has been cited as in the works, so I'm not gonna talk about this too much, but the jungle simply doesn't have enough mechanics, buffs, its objectives, etc. As for the ver verticality, simply increase the amount of ver verticality in the map. This was the main selling point for Paragon as a 3D MOBA when compared to something like Smite. This can be accentuated as a key identifying feature of Paragon, and you know what? It was really one of the key defining things that bound me to Paragon in early access. This would increase gameplay diversity, strategy, tactics, and even player retention and investment as it brings out the unique nature of this title. 19. Bring community members out for a brainstorm summit. Competitive players and content creators have incredibly insightful ideas. These can be your sources for information and ideas because they spend so much time playing and thinking about this game. B. Actually bringing people out to HQ. Epic HQ is a truly life-changing experience and I can attest to that from my own personal experience. This would increase the dedication and inspiration of top community members tremendously and keep that core that core force of in, in 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 the community thriving that will spread to everyone else 20 rework the attribute trees and hero scalings right now there is no significant advantage at the moment when one has a one to four attribute point lead over opponents which remember is a significant amount of gold in that sense either the stats from the attribute pips aren't meaningful enough one ha is waiting for another card because they cost you know such large intervals of of uh, of attributes or there simply isn't another card in the late game and therefore no truly meaningful infinite scaling in a match b attribute pips need to provide more significant and impactful stats so with the proposed changes that we'll get into right, right below, I suggest, and it's almost entirely necessary, reworking and splitting power back into basic damage and ability damage. Agility, the, the, the agility tree should provide core basic damage stats intended for carries, basic attack assassins, and fighters. Basic damage and attack speed should be given per point of agility, no more power or ability damage. Carries would focus on their basic attacks, which now scales from basic damage. Their abilities would have a core amount of base damage, but scale poorly from added ability damage, which is something we'll get into later. Vitality should provide defensive stats intended for tanks, brawlers, and even supports. Health and both types of armor should be given per point of vitality. One, ability armor though will be the majority of the armor given in order to fulfill the core MOBA triangle and keep tanks relatively vulnerable to carries and take into consideration the fact that most tanks are melee heroes that thrive off of basic armor anyways. The MOBA counter triangle is as follows. Carries counter tanks, tanks counter mages, and mages counter carries. F. Intellect should provide ability damage and mana intended for mages, supports, and utility heroes. Ability damage and mana should be given per point of intellect. Supports and utility heroes would have reduced ability scaling from power. Any required damage or utility would simply be tweaked into their base kit 
and hero level scalings and not go and not received from that additional ability damage supports and utility heroes would have higher base mana regen to fit their more supportive and utility based nature g tweak tweak hero scaling and base numbers according to the intended role as 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 this system would require supports require mana mana regen and some health and armor but not damage reduce supports basic attack and ability scaling from basic damage and ability damage this therefore enables supports to go into intellect which provides ability damage but not actually deal damage from that ability damage due to their poor uh, ability damage scaling tanks require health and armor with some damage tanks should have reduced ability and basic attack scaling but higher base health and, and armor numbers and hero level scaling this disables tanks from scaling from either damage type through their basic attack or abilities but still benefit from health armor and even mana for their abilities if going into intellect carries at least basic damage carries we don't really have ability ability damage carries at the moment require basic attack damage and attack speed but not necessarily ability damage heroes intended for the carry role should have high base basic attack scaling from basic damage but low ability scaling from ability damage mages require ability damage scaling without basic attack scaling so mages should have reduced basic attack scaling for basic damage and mages would need high ability damage scaling from ability damage tweaking all base health base mana and base damage to reflect the new scaling and stat collection would absolutely be needed any previous damage on any hero or role that was reliant on power would simply need to be be worked into the base kit instead since power no longer exists for example since the abilities of carries are still part of their damage output but not but will not scale from power now the damage that was there before will now just need to be incorporated into the base damage of the ability and another big consideration is that tweaking card stats would be completely necessary now that core stats are provided more by attributes cards can be focused more on the secondary stats but more importantly be focused around their unique gameplay impacting actives and passives which has been the vision for the card system all along that's what this has been all about this also enables cards to be focused towards a particular role even more if a card, say, gives a lot of basic damage, then that is a lot more significant now since one may already have a lot of basic damage, say, as a basic basic damage assassin, therefore uh, amplifying and accentuating one's performance in a basic damage role. This rework enables each attribute purchase to provide core gameplay and role-defining stats with each purchase, which also is it gives a good competitive edge in the highest levels of play and gives more meaning to the smallest of economic advantages possible this also allows cards to be focused around the unique gameplay impacting nature and less about stats i wish all the best in the continued effort to make paragon's potential realized i have nothing but the best of wishes and intents for the success of this game and i hope that these thoughts and ideas are met with open arms and warm hearts please continue the development of paragon and please actualize the vision of paragon to its fullest release the game hashtag bake the cake <laughs> i look forward to its release and the bright future of that paragon in my opinion most certainly has guys please like this video please share this video with everybody that you know make reddit posts about it put it on the facebook group send it email it around everything please 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 share it as um you know what even if you don't agree um you know they, these are ideas because they need these ideas at the moment so please please share this and of course guys subscribe all that stuff check out my social media huge thank you to all the people that support me in the last couple of days it's been phenomenal patreon supporters youtube youtube sponsors twitch subscribers you guys are all incredible and also ladies and gentlemen if you don't know huge shout out to mark rain he is the vice president of epic games and co-founder of the entire company i mean honestly a legend 
he came to my stream and hung out, discussed Paragon, discussed the future, wanted feedback. That is how much people care about Paragon at Epic Games, and it was really special to see him out to see to to see him, uh, you know, in his in his community. So go go follow him on Twitter. Say thank you. Say tell him that it was inspirational because it honestly really really was. Thank you guys. Till next time, like always, stay optimistic and positive.